I thought I'd go over uh, chapter 21 in this same fashion, just in case. Slide two is just preview, so I'm skipping it. Slide three is your new best friend. This is a really great tool. Um, I'll come back to it over and over and over again. The gist is you have two major pathways um, that, that serve your immune defenses, the innate pathway and the acquired or uh, same thing as adaptive. And unfortunately, same thing as learned. Gross. Uh, pathway. And um, your immune system is not a case of either or. Uh, it's not like the same thing as sympathetic or parasympathetic. It's more like somatic and autonomic. Okay, so typically you respond to pathogens using both your innate and your acquired immunity. The bad news about these words is that innate often means instinctual, built in, born with, whereas acquired means just that, uh, acquired with experience. And I think those are very misleading terms. Uh, so grain of salt, um, because there are plenty of uh, acquired immune defenses that you're born with. And there are plenty of innate um, immune defenses that, that you don't necessarily exhibit at birth unless you need them. So don't get too stuck on the literal meaning of innate and acquired. What is the basic difference between the two is that innate defenses are not very specific as to which pathogens or which antigens are being attacked or even to that matter um, how they're being attacked. Whereas acquired defenses are pathogen and or antigen specific. Anywho, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna attack this fraction. I'm now on slide four. Uh, this fraction of the innate defenses, the external innate defenses, okay? And then later we'll attack internal innate defenses. And then later still, we'll talk about acquired defenses. But for now, we're just gonna talk about external innate defenses, okay? And behaviors are things that we do, whether we need to or not in order to um, minimize the likelihood that a pathogen or more to the point an antigen infiltrates the body. Things that we do. And a behavior is a response to any stimulus, okay? I'm gonna give you just a, a short example or a short list of examples of, of behaviors that uh, help to uh, maintain our external innate defenses. Blinking, blinking. Um, one of my favorites, avoidance behavior. If we think something's gross, then we avoid it. And uh, we'll go with bathing, showering or bathing, keeping the body clean. Uh, the reason why I'm giving you such a short list is because I will put a question on exam two about uh, behaviors, and uh, part of that will be uh, asking you to, to come up with as many as you can. So uh, I, want, I want you to think, 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 okay? Anywho, um, let's move on. We also have barriers, I'm now on slide five, in place that, that uh, serve our external innate defenses. Uh, again, these simply bar antigens and or pathogens from entering the body or at least uh, penetrating any further into the body. And uh, barriers include the uh, acidic environment of the stomach. In fact, personally, I refer to the stomach as the pit of despair um, because if all else fails, 
we uh, send bad guys automatically to our stomach by swallowing continuously and uh, thereby ensure that, that bad guys can't get far. Um, because if they, if they make it all the way into the stomach, then, then uh, chances are the acidic environment of the stomach uh, will, will be their, uh, their end. <laughs> Pit of despair. So one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that stomach acid um, is is uh, important here is because that's not exactly external, is it? Um, so so grain of salt with the word, word external, uh, external uh, maybe maybe think of it as as uh, doesn't let the pathogen get any further, any deeper within. And technically, the the lining of our digestive tract, uh, much of our respiratory system, is in contact with external environment. So um, it, that's sort of the the line of thinking. Anywho, barriers are many, 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 uh, and barriers and behaviors are sometimes thought of as our first line of defense. I just circled that on slide six. I'm now on slide seven, and we have a number of barriers in place, including the sheer number of cells that comprise our skin, the, the layers and layers of cells, keratin, which helps to um, waterproof our skin, glycolipids, which help to waterproof our skin, enzymes in saliva, enzymes in respiratory mucus, enzymes in tears, and obviously enzymatic uh, digesters in stomach, right? But also the acidity of the stomach. Um, mucus itself acts as a trap. Defensins, uh, where did that go? There it is, defensins. I think maybe we've talked about defenses before uh, in this quarter, but certainly you learned about them in the context of skin in 241. Uh, sebum, which along with sweat, uh, helps to establish the, the acid mantle, the acidity of our skin. Uh, but we also have acidic urine. And uh, we uh, can find an acidic environment in the vagina. I do not see vagina on the slide. I might just be blind or maybe I just wanted the opportunity to write vagina. Um, which, come on, nobody's surprised. Uh, let's see. In um, sweat, we can find dermcidin. Sebum includes lipids, which act as a barrier. Um, mucosae act as a barrier. Um, just in case you're rusty, mucosa is plural, mucosa is singular. Nose hairs, uh, cilia help to sweep, especially mucus, um, up from often respiratory tract into pharynx where we automatically swallow that mucus and anything that's trapped within and we send therefore the mucus and more importantly anything that's trapped within to the pit of despair which again is the stomach okay so there's your list of barrier defenses we're moving on now to uh internal innate defenses so i just boxed that on slide eight this is sometimes uh, considered our second line of defense. Slide nine is just preview, so I can skip that because I'm gonna go into more detail about it anyway. Uh, one of the attributes of our, of our uh, internal innate defenses are the phagocytes. And uh, as you already know, all of the, the leukocytes can practice phagocytosis. I mean, technically, any cell that's alive can practice phagocytosis. Um, but the most sort of voracious, uh, pathogen-targeting phagocytes in our bodies are neutrophils and macrophages. And neutrophils um, 
they're they're the most abundant, of course. Never let monkeys eat bananas, um, and they also tend to be sort of uh, the the first on the on the line of battle. So, like the first troops to arrive, um, but they they actually exhaust themselves to death. The good news is that by the time neutrophils are perishing on the front line, macrophages have arrived, and macrophages are even more robust, so they're they're more lasting. And often when we talk about macrophages, we imagine free macrophages, those that would sort of wander um, through tissues and and really through intracellular, uh, I'm sorry, extracellular space. Um, but there are also some macrophages that are that are fixed. Um, within certain tissues or fixed within certain organs. Um, examples include mast cells, like the mast of a ship, mast cells, um, which are fixed in connective tissues. Uh, stellate macrophages are fixed in the liver. Microglia are macrophages that are fixed in the brain, so on and so forth. Phagocytosis in this context of sort of recognizing, uh, claiming, and, and engulfing a, a bad guy or an antigen, um, it, it actually involves a number of steps. And the first step is called opsonization. Opsonization is the application of proteins that are called opsonins. And opsonins act like handles, okay? They're like like molecular handles, and they provide phagocytes something to grab onto. So literally handles, both functionally and and in terms of, of shape, all right? And our phagocytes, for the most part, they, they, um, they move about via cytoplasmic streaming, which we talked about in class already. They move about like amoebas, in other words. Okay, and when uh, a cytoplasmic um, cytoplasmic Lee streaming uh, cell sort of like reaches out, uh, extends part of its cytoplasm and, and plasma membrane outward to, to grab something, that extension is called a pseudopod or a pseudopodium. Um, more than one would be, would be pseudopodia. So uh, the first step is is apply those those handles. The second step is to reach out, okay, grab and engulf that that particle, that antigen, that pathogen, whatever it may be, and place it into a vesicle, which is called a phagosome. A phagosome inside the phagocyte. The phagosome will fuse with a lysosome, and you already know that a lysosome um, contains digestive enzymes. Together, phagosome and lysosome form phagolysosome. Okay? The contents of that phagolysosome become highly acidic, and that sort of activates. Um, it is also um, furthered by the efforts of the enzymes in the lysosome, uh, finally sort of getting access to um, the, the bad guy that was in the phagosome. And then anything that the phagocyte can't digest um, or uh, wouldn't desire to keep gets exocytosed, exocytosed. So if we move to slide 12, we can see at least most of those steps uh, listed. What's missing? Opsonization. That part is not shown or, or mentioned, and that's an important part. So opsonization, uh, form the phagosome, uh, form the phagolysosome, um, destroy, and then exocytose if necessary, okay? Okay, the next slide, slide 13, um, I just wanted to make you aware that, that if all else fails, even if a, a microbe, for instance, is resistant to phagocytosis, we can 
turn to, to respiratory burst, which is something we studied already when we were first meeting neutrophils. Another aspect of internal innate defenses are the natural killer cells, which are actually kind of confusing um, because technically they are T cells and uh, almost almost exclusively we consider T cells to be part of acquired or adaptive immunity. This is the one exception. These are um, very different in that they don't require the same triggers, the same activation criteria that other T cells do. And so in that, in that sense, they're non-specific. And if they're non-specific, then they have to fall into the drawer or the folder of innate, okay? These guys are not phagocytic. They're not phagocytic. Um, but they do target our own cells gone wrong. So our own cells that are infected or our own cells that um, are cancerous, okay? And they tend to be the first to arrive on that particular battlefront, soon to be replaced by um, the the T cells that we do actually uh, associate with um, adaptive or acquired immunity. Okay. Moving on to inflammation. So I'm on slide 15, I believe. 16, 15, 15. Um, when inflammation occurs, it actually seems horrible uh, because it's accompanied by redness in the locale. Um, the location becomes warmer uh, to, to the touch. The location swells and we experience pain. In fact, these are the four cardinal signs of inflammation. Not, not pleasant. However, these these signs are are indicative of of things working quite well, um, because inflammation helps us to establish roadblocks temporarily, so that any bad guys that infiltrate the body can't get further in, can't get deeper in. Helps us to um, quickly mobilize the many different um, cells that are gonna, gonna assist in uh, disposing of bad guys, disposing of any damage, disposing of any debris, um, helps to sort of sound the alarm and alert um, the, the rest of the immune system and also um, helps to mobilize the different cells and the different materials necessary to uh, start repairing the wound site, okay? Moving to 16, there are three major steps of inflammation. Um, this is really just a preview slide, so I'm gonna move to the next slide, which is a bit messy. I'm, I'm gonna walk you through uh, what I was trying to do here. Um, so first step is the release of, of inflammatory chemicals. And uh, these are chemicals that are typically released by injured tissues. However, be aware that they can also be released by a variety of, of immune cells, cells that serve the immune system, um, and some of the proteins found in our blood. One of the, the most commonly uh, recognized inflammatory chemicals is histamine, histamine. And there are other types of inflammatory chemicals, kinins, prostaglandins, and complement proteins. Um, but but uh, if you learn one, make sure that it is histamine, okay? And no matter what the inflammatory chemical is, it's going to trigger vasodilation, of course, just local vasodilation. It's going to trigger an increase in vascular permeability which really these two are the next step anyway, okay? And 
um, depending on, on what type of inventory chemical, it the chemical could also um, sort of heighten the sensitivity of pain receptors just to ensure that we do experience pain um, and uh, potentially prompt the release of even more inflammatory uh, chemicals uh, may, again, sound an alarm, okay? But the, the guaranteed functions are to um, bring about local vasodilation and increase um, local vascular permeability, okay? And typically, uh, the immune cells that participate in inflammatory chemical release will release a, a general type of, of uh, signal called cytokines. And cytokines or cytokines, um, they promote inflammation. Macrophages and a few other cells in, in the body in particular have pattern recognition receptors that are called toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors allow certain immune cells, including macrophages, to recognize not specific bad guys, but classes of bad guys. So for instance, if uh, a macrophage has toll-like receptor number five, then it can recognize the patterns in the flagella of gram-negative bacteria. It can't recognize which gram-negative bacteria a bad guy is. It can just recognize that that bad guy is a gram-negative bacterium and thereby respond in a, in a slightly matchy-matchy way. So still uh, not as specific as acquired or adaptive immunity, but not completely general, not completely vague, not completely in the dark. So we do have a little bit of specificity available um, via our innate um, immune system. And there are a number of different TLRs. However, I attempted to cross this out before, before opening the file. I don't need you to know how many TLRs. And this quarter, I'm moving on to slide 18. Um, I'm not going to ask you to know any of the TLRs or, or what they're tied to. Just know that there, there's a diversity. Um, moving on to slide 19. Again, the second step in um, uh, inflammation is vasodilation, local, of course, and localized uh, increase in vascular permeability. Vasodilation, in particular, triggers hyperemia, hyperemia. And hyperemia occurs when we are sending an excessive amount of fluid out of capillary beds, all right? And um, that increased permeability in that locale is one of the reasons why we have lots of fluid uh, uh, arriving at the site and lots of fluid leaving the circulatory system as exudate, okay? And having local vasodilation and local increased vascular permeability means that we experience local swelling. And so that's one of the reasons, or one of the rather cardinal signs is swelling. Another cardinal sign you might recall is pain. And one of the reasons why we experience pain during inflammation is that this exudate, this exudate is applying pressure to our local nerve endings. Why do we wanna feel pain? So that we know something's wrong. Pain is not enjoyable, but it's very, very necessary. Moving on to slide 20. The um, third major step in inflammation is phagocyte mobilization. And again, neutrophils, I know you can't see this here, but I'm sure you can see it on your version, um, the, the one that you print. Uh, neutrophils arrive first and macrophages act as sort of like the, the replacement troops, okay? And they're gonna be more lasting. Um, the four steps 
in phagocyte mobilization, meaning getting phagocytes to where they need to be, are leukocytosis, margination, diapedesis, and chemotaxis. Leukocytosis means, hey, let's make um, a, a plethora of um, white blood cells. Let's make more white blood cells than we normally would. At least in this particular context, that's what that means. And specifically, what we want to want to churn out like crazy are neutrophils. Okay, and specifically, gosh, I just said specifically twice. Our bone marrow is told to engage in leukocytosis specifically of neutrophils um, because injured tissues are sending out chemical messengers called leukocytosis inducing factors. Following that leukocytosis of neutrophils, um, we're going to see neutrophils and for that matter macrophages following them um, marginate, meaning that they are going to hug, uh, really stick, to the adhere to the the vessel wall uh, in in the general area of the the wound or the the issue okay and when they stick to that wall when they grab on to the vessel wall uh, they they will kind of reach out and hold and then reach out and hold and then reach out and hold and they'll roll along, and we'll see this visually in class. They roll along until they find um, a nice uh, cleft between endothelial cells, and then they squeeze out of that vessel via diapedesis, which we've talked about before. Now, the only thing that's left is, hey, let's actually find this wound site. Let's find where this damage is occurring. And so um, damaged tissues are sending out, as well as any other uh, white blood cells that have arrived are likely to be sending out um, beacons, uh, chemotactic agents, really chemical messengers that say, over here, come here, come here, come here, come here, chemotaxis means movement, that's what taxis is, toward a chemical stimulus, chemo, okay? As the attack continues, monocytes are going to arrive, they're gonna leave via diapedesis the um, blood vessel and differentiate into macrophages and, and replace those neutrophils that are by now probably dying. Okay, uh, there's some visual support for you on slide 21, but I think you'll actually be served best by um, the, the video that we're gonna watch in class. So we'll watch this one together. This is on slide 22, okay? And then on slide, oh, you don't actually have 23. I, I just created this one. Um, I just wanna, wanted to, to reiterate that the steps are, um, inflammatory chemical release, vasodilation and increased vascular permeability, and phagocyte mobilization, which itself has sub-steps. And the sub-steps to phagocyte mobilization are leukocytosis, followed by margination, followed by diapedesis, followed by chemotaxis, okay? And, and you know, make, make whatever mnemonic you need, I don't know, Lick, lick more. <laughs> I know who you are and what you're thinking. Um, I don't know, darn cats, something like that. <laughs> okay, anyway, moving on, another aspect of our internal innate defenses are the antimicrobial proteins. And the key antimicrobial proteins that that, uh, that we at least lean on most so are interferons and complement proteins on chapter, I'm sorry, slide number 24, okay? Slide 25, we're talking about interferons. Now, personally, I think you already know, I'm, I'm a very visual learner. So I'm actually gonna skip 25 and go straight to 26. Here's what's happening in the case of interferons. Let's say we have 
two cells. Uh, they're both our own body cells. Okay. Here's cell one and here's cell two. And cell one, before it can do anything about it, gets infected by a virus. Okay. And personally, I think of this virus as a zombie. The zombie has entered the house. Okay. But the cell at number one is so conscientious, it's such a great neighbor, that it, it picks up the phone and calls cell number two to let cell number two know, oh my gosh, there's a zombie in the house, I've been bitten, it's too late for me, save yourself, okay? And that phone call is is delivered in the form of interferon molecules. In other words, that first cell secreted interferons, which signaled the second cell to block, block that particular virus from entering the cell. No, zombie, you're not coming in. So again, for me, this is, this is the, I don't know, save yourself. <laughs> antimicrobial protein. I've been zombified. It's too late for me. Save yourself. Moving on to slide 27. Complement. Complement is so interesting. Um, so the complement system is actually comprised of, of many, many different proteins that work together. Um, however, this quarter, we're going to really simplify this. Uh, I'm going to scooch, scooch along. Uh, 28 and 29, we're going to skip this quarter, okay? And what I really want you to know about complement, I can actually talk about by using the image on slide 30. I need you to know that complement proteins, once activated, they uh, enhance inflammation. They enhance inflammation. They facilitate opsonization handles being applied, okay? But possibly most important and uh, probably most easy to remember is that complement proteins assemble into what looks a bit like a golf tee. And many of these golf tees, and these golf tees are called membrane attack. complexes. Okay, many of these membrane attack complexes, they will assemble into a ring. Okay, and this ring uh, penetrates the plasma membrane of a bad guy and, and makes a hole, but also stabilizes that hole so that uh, the, the target has no choice, it, it, it ruptures, it undergoes lysis, okay? And this is actually our main murdering tool. Um, our, our immune system uses this to, to murder bad guys more so than, than anything else, okay? And personally, I think that an assembly of membrane attack complexes looks like and acts very much like a grommet. Uh, grommets are those metal things at the top of your shower curtain. Uh, not only is it, it is a hole punched, but the hole is stabilized. It's um, it's penetrated from closing or not penetrated. Uh, gosh, what is the word? Gosh, what is the word? Uh, yeah, I can't access that. <laughs> I can't access that right now. Um, Boy, that's weird. Uh, it's not allowed to to close back up, or it's not allowed to tear, or anything like that. So, very much like like a grommet, and very very important. Prevented. Uh, anyway, complement proteins are, are yet another antimicrobial protein, um, and, and very important. Uh, also, um, part of our internal innate defenses. And then last on our list for internal innate defenses, I'm on slide 31. Although. 
uh, because I added that other slide, it's probably slide 30 for you guys, is fever. And fever is nonspecific, um, but it's not absolutely blind. Um, when our white blood cells encounter certain foreign substances, they secrete a chemical messenger, a, a, a cell signal, if you will, called a pyrogen. And pyrogens target specifically our hypothalamus, the, the portion of our hypothalamus that acts as our thermostat and cause uh, our body's temperature to increase. And a lot of people think that, that fever is a way to, I suppose, cook bad guys. But think about it. If fever was, was hot enough to cook bad guys, what else would you cook? You'd end up cooking yourself. And so, so that's a, a really um, common misconception, but also somewhat silly. So what does fever actually do for us if it doesn't cook bad guys? Uh, it does two things. It triggers our liver and spleen to sequester, uh, lock away, iron and zinc in particular. Okay, which are needed by many microbes or cells in general uh, to to uh, successfully exhibit or um, perform cell division. So if they don't have access to iron and zinc, then they can't do cell division. So one one uh, effect of um, beaver is to cause or trigger the secretion. Oh my gosh, our liver and spleen to sequester iron and zinc. And then the other is um, simply the increase in temperature increases the rate of metabolism so that we can churn out army and weapons even faster. Okay, now you'll see on my slides, I have something added. I highly recommend that you use this template and just fill it out. You can write directly on this sort of thing. Or personally, what I did is I used uh, text.